All right. Uh, you know, we are moving through the program here in terms of uh, you know, very logically the way it's been structured. I love, I love the way this whole conference has been set up uh, in terms of its of the logic of it. Because yesterday we had a we began by looking at the state of research. We looked at the at where things are in terms of understanding impacts of unexploded munitions in the seas and and chemical compounds there. And we talked about that from different angles. Um, today, we looked at the legal aspects of it, international and domestic, at least in, with respect to where we are here in Germany. Uh, now, we're going to get into some of the, the detail, the nitty gritty of how we get out there and find out how we know, how we know what we know, right? We're going to look at detection and identification technologies that are helping us to understand the scope of the problem and what sort of uh, methods there may be that might be appropriate for dealing with those. This session is going to be moderated by Frank Zäubling. He's technical director of Boscalis Hirdis, uh, or Heinrich Hirdis, uh, and uh, EOD services, which deals specifically with locating and recovering ordnance on the seabed. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Zäubling. So good morning, everyone. Thanks, Terry, for uh, introducing me. Finally, we're going to discuss technique. And for the engineers amongst you and the technicians, which I'm sure are lots of you are here in the room or joining us online. Um, Terry said we discussed a lot of science yesterday. Today we'll do a, a little bit of science, but also quite a lot about technique, uh, survey sensors, uh, disposal methods, so I think it's quite interesting. Um, you will see three chairs, although we have four speakers. Um, Mike uh, Richardson, unfortunately, can't join us uh, because of the ongoing travel restrictions. It would be impossible for him to travel to Germany, so he's going to join us online. And um, Mike is a technical advisor to the SERDP and ESTCP program, which was also discussed uh, yesterday. Uh, it came uh, about in uh, certain sessions. So he's going to go into detail on that. It tells us about survey sensors, uh, sensor platforms for deep water, for the surf zone, for shallow waters. Um, he will also um, explain a bit on cooperations, ongoing cooperations between uh, German and United States research programs. Uh, second speaker we'll have is, uh, luckily with us, Herman Lammers, Commander Herman Lammers. Um, Herman joined the Dutch Navy in 1986, if I'm correct, and since uh, August 2019, he's uh, director of the NATO Mine Warfare Center of Excellence based in Ostende in Belgium. And he will take us through the role of uh, NATO mine warfare competences, and <coughs> that will be a little bit different than what we just heard from uh, Vice Admiral Schoenbach, uh, about the role of the German Navy and the role of the NATO navies is a little bit different, so he's going to tell us all about that. Third speaker we'll have today is Professor Dr. Jens Greinert. Um, people who already joined us yesterday have seen him jumping up to the microphone already a couple of times. Um, Jens is uh, head of the Deep Sea Monitoring Group of the Geomar Helmholtz uh, Center of Ocean Research here in Kiel, just around the corner, actually. And um, Jens will, sorry, <coughs> will uh, take us through the edge of science of detection and classification of buried and non-buried ob objects. We already see some uh, examples yesterday of what uh, Geomar has been uh, able to do over the last couple of years. And uh, last but of course not least, Jan Wendt, uh, who is the initiator of uh, this, uh, this week will also explain a bit uh, on uh, data and what the role of data can, uh, let's say, be of assistance in the task we have at hand. So may I invite you up to the, to the stage? <coughs> and I see Mike is already joining. Good morning or good night. Mike, it must be very early for you. Yes, it is. Yeah, so thanks for joining. Yeah. Thanks for joining us in this very odd time. Um, 
Um, okay, I'll give the word to you, Mike, and um, please go ahead. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank the conference organizers for the opportunity to participate um, in the um, Munitions Clearance Week at Kiel. As you can see from the background, uh, uh, it's dark out here. It's about two o'clock in the morning. I live just outside of New Orleans, Louisiana. And had it not been for COVID, um, I probably would have tried to schedule a flight out, uh, which probably would have been impossible anyway. Anyway, I'm going to switch to the share screen, hopefully. And begin, Does that, can everyone see that? Frank, is uh, that visible? Yep, it's uh, very well visible. Okay, thank you very much. Um, the CERTIP ESDCP Munitions Response Program supports the development and demonstration of innovative technologies that characterize, remediate, and scientifically manage sites affected by military munitions, including unexploded ordnance and discarded uh, military munitions. In this presentation, I'm going to uh, provide a review of the progress achieved by the munitions response program. Uh, the details for the CERTIP SDCP program can be found at the website listed on this slide. Uh, the site provides a summary of the program objectives and, and summaries of um, including reports from 82 completed and 74 active projects, a number of which are uh, have been completed or are underway from European investigators. The website also provides reports from numerous workshops that are used as a guide for the program direction. Well, I'm trying to change the slide here. Okay. The current emphasis of the munitions response program is on uh, sensors and platforms for UXO detection, localization, and classification for wide area and detailed surveys, primarily the uh, emphasis of this particular session. But we also uh, have uh, work done on development and understanding of UXO behavior in order to develop models that predict UXO burial mobility and reemergence. The development of remediation technologies designed for recovery and disposal of UXO. This is the next se session. And the development of technologies for environmental characterization at remediation sites. Projects characterizing and modeling the environmental risk of munitions uh, constituents released from corroding UXOs can be found at another site in uh, at CERTA PSDCP. Uh, it's the Environmental Restoration Program website. And conclusions from this work can be found on a recently published workshop report from Project ER2341. This can be found on the same sort of website. Underwater remediation sites contain a wide variety of environments, coastal, estuarine, freshwater lakes, and riverine environments. The water depths for UXO remediation for our program range from the shore to depths of about 40 meters, which is diver, recreational diver depths. The range of freshwater, brackish, and marine environments requires a wide variety of sensors and platforms for wide area and detailed surveys. The areas of interest are US sites, but te the technology developed and demonstrated um, in this program are, are not site specific. We therefore support a number of projects and PIs in Europe. This photograph shows a range of some of the UXO target sizes and types from 20 millimeter to up to 155 millimeter, including projectiles, mortars, and grenades. Note that the UXO of interest for our program do not typically include mines and larger bombs. Most UXO, have densities, which is in the second part of this slide, the lower half, that are greater than typical sediment grain size. That is, that's the red line across the, gra the graph, which is 
uh, uh, 2,650 kilograms per meter square, uh, which is the uh, grain density. Uh, this is an important factor for prediction of uh, munitions um, burial and mobility. At terrestrial sites, which is what the, with, where this program began, active electromagnetic induction sensors that are either handheld or towed across the surface on carts are the sensors and platform of choice. However, in underwater environments, no single sensor or platform mod modality can cover all environments, UXO types and locations. Therefore, a variety of sensor types, including high frequency acoustic imaging, lower frequency synthetic aperture sonars, passive magnetic sensors, cued and, sing and single pass active electromagnetic systems, and the full range of optical sensors such as LIDAR, still and video images are included in our program. Platforms include autonomous underwater vehicles, remotely operated vehicles, surface towed or mounted vehicles, bottom crawlers, and a variety of airborne platforms. The choice of sensors and platform depends on water depth, UXO, UXO state, whether buried or proud, sediment type and terrain types, water clarity, and the hydrodynamic and meteorological conditions. EMI and magnetic um, magnetometer technologies include modified advanced geophysical systems that have been proven for terrestrial UXO classification. Military systems developed for mine countermeasures operations, commercially available systems, and purpose-built systems designed specifically for underwater UXO remediation. Magnetometers have greater standoff detection, detection ranges up to five meters and are better suited for wide area surveys, whereas the shorter detection ranges, uh, one to three meters for active electromagnetic systems result in smaller coverage rates but provide UXO classification in survey modes or for queued classification. Some examples of the magnetometers include the marine toad array, which is in the upper left-hand corner of this slide, developed by the Naval Research Lab. This has been a workhorse for underwater wide area survey. In the lower left, an example of a magnetometer developed for autonomous mine hunting by the Navy, and on the far right, White, uh, White River Technologies has developed a drone-based magnetometer for wide area surveys in hard to access shallow water sites. The Advanced Electromagnetic Induction EMI system, sens uh, sensors and systems and signal processing or inversions developed for land-based UXO classification dominate CERTIF's development of underwater EMI systems. The main logistical difficulties in EMI technology in the marine environment include waterproofing all the sensors, uh, receivers, trans uh, transmitter loops, and electronics for a conductive environment, designing optimal transistor coil, transmitter coil, and receiver cube configurations, and providing appropriate platform support, including navigation and positioning for operation in a rather dynamic and often GPS denied environment. Numerical modeling and field studies have demonstrated that the inversion and classifica uh, classification technology, library matching and statistical classification methods developed for the, the terrestrial setting are in principle adaptable to the underwater environment. The influence of eddy current response due to currents generated in the target and the galvanic coupling of currents through the body, the, the current channeling response, may affect the scattered field from a, a metallic target, but typically only at very early times and for large receiver to object offsets. The effects of background subtraction from highly, a highly variable C4 vertical gradients and horizontal variability is still an ongoing area of research. Some of the platforms being demonstrated uh, include sleds, ROVs, AUVs, and towed EMI systems with various combinations of receivers and transmitter loops. On the left is an EMI array uh, towed by a bottom crawler. This system is designed for very shallow water, including the surf zone. The marine toad array from NRL and the Ultra-TAM-A 
marine towed system from Black Tusk and Tector Tech are ship towed systems. These systems are being prepared for demonstration and appear to be excellent systems for UXO detection and classification at sites deeper than five meters. Both use different configurations of the Ultra TEM EMI system developed by GAP Explosives Detection in Australia. The Ultra TEM is scheduled for demonstration this month at an ESDCP uh, demonstration site at Squim Bay, uh, which Dave Bradley talked about yesterday. Optical and de uh, detection and classification systems. Steve Ackles Ackleson from NRL, the upper left, is investigating the use of active fluorometric imaging for detection and classification of military munitions underwater. Jeb Wilbur, along with Jules Jaffe, are developing underwater an underwater laser system on the right, uh, using structure from motion and structured light technologies to provide 3D images of the seafloor. Jeffrey Thayer on the bottom left is supported on several of the uh, CERTA projects for the development of an airborne lighter, which provide, provides high, re high resolution bathymetry maps and has high enough resolution to detect, locate, and classify proud UXO in shallow water. Optical and still video cameras obviously still have a place in the UXO wide area surveys, but much of that development for those systems is supported in other groups and is not an emphasis uh, on the CERTA program. Barrier UXO are, are considered the biggest threat and much of our emphasis is on synthetic aperture sonar systems that can detect and classify buried UXO based on both imaging and structural acoustic responses. Acoustics offer increased standoff distances relative to magnetic and the EMI detection and classification system. This in turn both increases area coverage rates and deployments and adds uh, safety advantages. Several synthetic aperture sonar systems are ready for demonstration. Commercial side scan, interferometric, or multi-beam sonars uh, that have re uh, resolutions needed to detect and classify um, proud UXO are also supported for uh, proud targets. Uh, we are also supporting the, uh, the development of machine learning or uh, classification algorithms to detect and classify UXO, um, both using acoustic imaging and the structural acoustic response from the UXO. Dave Williams from CMRE developed some uh, CNN uh, algorithms used to classify UXO from the synthetic aperture sonar uh, responses. We're also part supporting programs to improve uh, and uh, speed up the FEM techniques that are used to develop and provide training data for these classification algorithms, as in situ data is scarce and expensive to co uh, collect. Platform requirements we support include navigation and positioning, coverage rates, and using multiple sensor modalities. Geolocation to, uh, to reacquire targets, environmental characterization, both a water column and uh, surface sediment and deeper sediment classification is also being developed. On this, uh, this slide on the top shows NRL, Naval Research Labs, autonomous side looking and down looking sonars. Both of these are deployed on a Bluefin 21, uh, 21 AUV. System did quite well at detection and classification of UXO in very cluttered waters in the approaches to bottom uh, Boston Harbor. A pontoon, pontoon boat mounted, uh, mounted sediment volume search sonar uh, was designed for very shallow water by Dan Brown at Penn State. This system has been demonstrated in a freshwater reservoir and in a remediation pond. Demonstrations and development are continuing. Kevin Williams at the Applied Physics Lab at the University of Washington uh, developed the Toad Multisensor Tow Body, MUST. This system includes a Focus 3 Tow Body, an EdgeTech uh, EBOS synthetic aperture sonar, and an EdgeTech uh, 2205 side scan sonar with winch layout for deployment and recovery operations. This synthetic aperture sonar system has done well in engineering tri uh, trials and will be demonstrated uh, later this month at our demonstration site again at Squim 
um, Washington. Uh, these two demonstrations I discussed here are uh, going to be run back to back. Migration studies have been uh, primarily focused on sandy coastlines. Uh, study areas include from the right to left the shoaling zone, the energetic surf zone, and the swash zone. Research includes field op op uh, observations, laboratory measurements, and simulations and predictions. Models of the hydrodynamic conditions at length and time scales relevant to, to the prediction of UXO, burial, and migration are being developed. Um, all the field and laboratory results, along with information from the literature, are compiled uh, in a probabilistic expert system, UNMESS, uh, which has been validated for nearshore sandy environments. Other complementary UXO burial models are being developed by Peter Chu at the Naval Postgraduate School and by Peter Menzel in Rostock, Germany. Uh, this topic will be covered later in uh, today, uh, and I look forward to it. Uh, Pass remediation pra uh, practices include the costly and dangerous use of divers to locate and remove UXO, the Navy in this case, or equally dangerous and often environmentally unacceptable blow in place methods. Obviously, this was discussed earlier and is unacceptable uh, because of the um, leakage or uh, you're bringing energetics into the environment. So I certainly uh, look forward to the discussions uh, on this topic later today in session five. The earlier sort of PSC uh, project supported approaches, including bubble currents, which have been talked to, uh, talked about here already, to reduce shock wave and acoustic pressures, covering the UXO with geotextile, geotextile bags, a removal by very large magnets, robust underwater caisson-like structures to contain explosives and munitions products, products dredging and modi uh, dredging modifications to detect and remove UXO, and the development of robotic techniques which eliminate the use of divers. Here's a few of the newer techniques that we're trying to develop. These own ongoing projects uh, uh, include in the upper left a high pressure water jet to clean, cut holes in UXO and wash out and capture the explosives material. Um, explosives generated, uh, an explosive, explosively generated plasma tool to cut holes in UXO and provide high temperature chemical decomposition of the energetics without uh, detonation, which is in the upper right. Uh, ablative chemical drilling and electrochemical techniques to transform energetics into stable compounds and blast barge technology. At this point, we don't feel we've developed an ideal safe and low cost method to physically remediate UXO in the underwater environment, especially UXO buried below the surface and those encrusted uh, with coral. We have two new projects uh, under evaluation or proposals under evaluation to, uh, to use geotextual geotextile bags to isolate, dewater large shallow coastal areas and then use typical EMI cart systems um, used at terrestrial sites to detect, classify, and dig up uh, buried UXO at very shallow water coastal sites. The second is to freeze blocks of sediments before removing contaminated sediments uh, from the seafloor. Uh, this will include removal of both the mission, munitions itself and the energetics that may have leaked from the corroded UXO. This is my last slide uh, as sort of a summary of uh, progress we've made uh, recently. Um, we have uh, developed the UNMESS system for uh, burial and uh, mi uh, migration and reemergence uh, predictions. Uh, and it is being translated, uh, transitioned to the Naval Research Lab within the next year with a uh, goal of developing a UXO probabilistic burial mi um, migration model that can be used by site managers. The models I mentioned before developed by Dr. Peter Menzel uh, at Rostock for European sites shows a good promise for transition to UXO, uh, US remediation sites. Uh, I believe uh, Peter Menzel will be giving a presentation 
during the technical showcases on Thursday. I'm not sure whether he's going to be talking about that, but we'll have to wait and see. Uh, several, as I mentioned, magnetic, acoustic, and EMI and optical systems are now ready for demonstration. Um, definitely, uh, in terms of uh, technologies to measure and model environmental factors uh, that might affect uh, the UXO behavior and performance of systems used in detect and classify, uh, classify UXO, we've made some definite progress. Uh, and the development of uh, acoustic sediment classification system, systems, uh, free fall penetrometers, development of, of models to predict nearshore hydrodynamic condition, including the effects on waves, currents, on, and on sediment transport bathymetry and UXO burial and migration. The last topic, uh, Dave Bradley uh, discussed this at length. Uh, we have de uh, developed four demonstration sites that will be used to demonstrate and hopefully validate the systems developed for UXO detection, localization, and classification. That includes the NATO CMRE run demonstration site in La Spezia, Italy. We hope some system developers at this conference will use this well documented and controlled demonstration sites for demonstra uh, demonstrations of their systems. Uh, that, uh, Dr. Uh, Catherine uh, Warner, Director of NATO CMRE Laboratory, is present at this conference and gave uh, a talk during the first session. And I'm sure she's interested in talking to anyone that would like to use the CMRE demonstration site. Thank you for your attention. Well, Mike, thank you. I think you've covered uh, more or less the entire field of uh, detection and identification technologies. Very nice to see that it's not just you know artist impressions or drawings, but it's actually sensors that do exist. And some of them are still in a, in a testing or experimental phase, but at least they're being used and being built. So it is technique we have at hand. Um, later on, uh, Jens Greinert will show us in his presentation what all these sensors can bring and what we can do with all this data. And Jan will also focus on that. For now, I would like to, uh, would like to give the word to uh, Herman Lommers. Um, he is going to explain to us um, what the uh, NATO Mine Warfare Center of Excellence is actually all about and why they are in the Zeebrugge. That must be for a reason as well, I guess, uh, Herman. Um, and he's going to tell us about his uh, sort of daily work and experiences so far. Herman, I'll give the floor to you. Yep. Thank you very much, uh, Frank. And we're uh, located in Oostend, uh, by the way. It's even beautiful, more beautiful than... Oh, uh, Zebra, uh, Zebra. Oostend, I'm sorry. <laughs> okay, thank you. Um, and uh, I, I have to start off with a, uh, with a disclaimer. Uh, in our name is uh, stated uh, NATO, Naval Mine Warfare Center of Excellence. But actually, we're not part of NATO. We are an ind independent uh, entity. Uh, providing uh, advice uh, to NATO, uh, and we are uh, a multinational uh, entity sponsored by the uh, the uh, um, sponsoring uh, nations. Um, so, uh, for this uh, independent uh, view, I also have to state this, this uh, disclaimer: this is not a NATO policy or NATO uh, ideas that I'm uh, going to present here, but from the, the Naval Mine Warfare Center of Excellence, uh, my personal opinion as well. First, I have to take uh, the, the uh, chance to uh, uh, say that uh, it's different. Uh, uh, naval mine countermeasures and uh, UXO clearance, for instance, uh, that, uh, I heard it uh, yesterday as well. But uh, naval, mine more uh, na naval mine countermeasures is, uh, is uh, there to prevent, reduce, and minimize the risk of uh, mines to, to shipping. And the equipment we use for that can also be used, of course, to detect, uh, uh, classify, identify UXOs. But primarily, it is based, uh, it is uh, used for uh, uh, mine countermeasures. Yeah, and this risk uh, is, uh, is uh, very important uh, for us. We have uh, some, uh, some parameters uh, to use uh, to, to uh, quantify this, um, this uh, risk. Uh, and that is uh, mines found and uh, percentage uh, clearance achieved. Um, and uh, with that, we can calculate the remaining uh, risk. And we also talk about uh, percentage clearance in a certain uh, area, how many mines uh, uh, are, uh, are there uh, neutralized, uh, and how many can, can uh, remain. And we're not to talk about, uh, about coverage. 
um, as uh, we are not interested in a whole area, but basically uh, some, uh, some specific uh, navigation routes to be cleared from, our, uh, from mines for, uh, for chipping. Yeah, with this uh, percentage clearance, we are able to calculate the uh, plan, task, and report um, our uh, progress in a certain uh, mission. And of course, we can uh, use these uh, equipment uh, for uh, uh, UXO clearance as well, uh, but that is uh, basically uh, an, another um, aim for, for that. Uh, and uh, I couldn't find a real uh, proper uh, definition, so I came up with, uh, with the, this one uh, my own. Um, I think it's uh, about detect, identify and dispose unexploded ordnance in a safe and environmentally uh, friendly uh, manner uh, in order to re reduce the risk uh, of shipping, uh, exploit the seabed uh, and reduce the risk of pollution to the environment. Uh, so that is basically uh, something different than we do with, uh, with MCM, because at the end, uh, you show it, uh, we, sh we saw it yesterday as well, we just blow up uh, the, the explosive uh, we found, uh, and then uh, it's, uh, it's a little bit safer for us, and, uh, and ships are able to, to pass uh, that uh, piece of sea uh, again. Uh, while uh, nowadays, looking at uh, a UXO clearance, we want to do it in a environmental friendly way without harming uh, the, the infrastructures uh, around it uh, and the seabed and also the sea life uh, especially. Uh, and our, uh, the equipment in, in use within NATO is not speci specifically designed uh, for that. Uh, and um, uh, Admiral Schoenbrun also mentioned it uh, uh, in his, uh, in his uh, keynote uh, address. Um, yeah, the, the way we operate uh, is different than, uh, than you do. We uh, do it with, uh, to be prepared for a, a real crisis uh, situations. Uh, and for that, we need to practice uh, our uh, way of working as well. Uh, train as you fight, fight as you train. And the clearing of UXOs is a perfect opportunity for, uh, for the NATO nations to use, to train that, uh, which is uh, uh, from, uh, from detecting to uh, neutral neutralization. Um, and um, uh, also mentioned by the Admiral, uh, within NATO, this is uh, uh, regularly uh, uh, executed. There are various uh, uh, historic uh, ordnance operations uh, around the uh, European uh, waters where uh, NATO nations uh, with the MCM Group uh, 1 um, are executing uh, uh, historical ordnance clearance operations. But then they use these systems and it always ends up with the Big Bang. Okay. Um, let's uh, have a look at the, the, the uh, uh, systems that we are using uh, for that. The, the older systems, uh, I, I won't uh, talk too much uh, about them, uh, hull-mounted sonar with some uh, ROV kind of uh, vehicles that uh, can identify and in the end neutralize uh, the, the explosives. Uh, I want to look a little bit further uh, ahead and, and the developments that are co going on, and that is basically uh, what we see in, uh, within NATO is a shift from unmanned uh, mine countermeasure, uh, is a shift to unmanned mine countermeasure systems. Uh, an example here uh, from, uh, from the US, the, the various types of, um, of unmanned uh, vehicles that are uh, being, uh, being developed and, uh, and, and getting into use. Um, these systems mainly have the same uh, uh, identification, uh, detect and identification uh, techniques based on, uh, on the acoustic uh, sonar still. Um, but you see that there are uh, developments of, uh, of new techniques uh, coming into, um, in, uh, being implemented into these systems as well. And I think the, the, the first present, uh, presenter gave a, a perfect example of the possibilities of uh, magnetic detection, uh, bottom penetration uh, sonars, uh, non-acoustic uh, detection uh, uh, with laser, for instance, but also with, um, with cameras uh, as well. Uh, so, but uh, the, the present uh, systems that are coming into to operations, uh, they uh, mainly use uh, the acoustic detection, side sense cone, uh, side scan uh, sonar, or uh, synthetic aperture sonars. To give you two examples uh, of these uh, techniques and, and these uh, 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 
systems are being uh, developed uh, is the Belgium Netherlands uh, replacement uh, project and the France uh, UK uh, project that is uh, going on. And basically, they both use the same uh, idea of uh, uh, implementing new uh, systems and techniques uh, for uh, naval mine countermeasures. Uh, the idea is to take the men out of the minefield uh, so that they're, they're not in, in any more uh, danger uh, and uh, operate uh, these vehicles from a certain distance, preferably outside uh, the minefield. Uh, if not uh, possible, then of course inside the minefield, but uh, make sure that they, uh, the ships are protected uh, properly. And uh, the systems uh, consist of uh, uh, USV uh, uh, with, uh, with towed uh, bodies, uh, side scan sonar, but also with uh, unmanned underwater vehicles, uh, autonomous of, or automated, uh, uh, whatever you want to call it, uh, as well as uh, then uh, mostly wire-guided uh, systems to uh, identify uh, and in the end neutralize the, uh, the mines found uh, within a certain uh, area. And here you see that we still use uh, various systems uh, within the detect to engage uh, cycle. Eh? Detect, uh, classification, identification, and then in the end, neutralization. Uh, and this is uh, uh, getting a, a challenge uh, with, with these systems because that means that you have to reacquire, relocate a certain uh, contact that you uh, detected. Uh, and that is uh, uh, one of the challenges we have to uh, overcome. Um, in the end, I believe that uh, this, this uh, techniques uh, will be uh, developed uh, further and further and that we will be able to uh, uh, switch over to, as we call it, uh, over the horizon uh, MCM, real uh, distance uh, far outside the, uh, the minefield, uh, sending in uh, unmanned vehicles who will be able to do all the work um, uh, uh, from, from a distance without uh, hopefully uh, human interference. For that, there's still uh, a step uh, to need uh, to, to be set. Um, there are uh, uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, challenges. Uh, for instance, um, with all these uh, vehicles, and even if you would have uh, uh, several nations operating together in a, a same area, uh, there will be a multiple of, of unmanned vehicles uh, in that area, and a multiple uh, uh, sensors will be used. Um, to organize that, uh, we need to come to a, 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 a way of, uh, of, of tracking uh, and, uh, and uh, make sure that uh, um, these uh, vehicles also can uh, collaborate uh, together. Um, and uh, for that, we need, uh, for sure, uh, artificial uh, intelligence. Uh, the vehicles have to make their own decision uh, when they uh, come up with a certain um, uh, threat or uh, another vehicle uh, in the area. Uh, and even further, uh, they might have uh, to take over the task uh, from one and each other. Uh, one uh, vehicle detecting something, uh, giving the position to another vehicle who then will uh, take care of it, for instance. Another challenge is uh, data processing. These systems are, uh, are, are, are very good. They provide uh, almost a, a, a photograph of, uh, of the sea bottom, uh, but they also generate a huge amount of data. Uh, now still there's a, a, a man in, in the loop in this uh, data processing, but uh, looking at uh, the, the amount of data we're expecting, uh, that is uh, actually impossible to have a man look at all this uh, data and process it. So uh, for that, we also need the automatic detection, classification, and identification. And uh, there are also, also uh, some vehicles that are uh, able to do that, but uh, still uh, we need to uh, adjust them and, and make them more, uh, more perfect uh, to do so. Um, as said, planning, tasking, reporting, evaluation, uh, the, this uh, variety of, uh, of vehicles that, uh, that will come available uh, will also uh, uh, make the planning process uh, quite, uh, quite difficult. And uh, with uh, artificial intelligence, the uh, human can be assisted uh, and uh, uh, pre-plans uh, and things can be, uh, can be made. And then you only have to uh, uh, accept them. And then in the end, uh, yeah, the question uh, is then, uh, is uh, a human uh, still uh, needed within this, uh, within this uh, uh, system? And I believe uh, in, uh, we have to come to a... Um, 
to obey of uh, working uh, uh, with these systems, let them do the, the main part of, uh, of, uh, of, of everything. Uh, and uh, yeah, for, uh, for the moment, we are legally bounded by uh, having a human uh, in the loop uh, before we can uh, uh, go over to uh, detonating a, a explosive, uh, for instance, uh, 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 weapon engagement, as we call that. Uh, for that, still uh, a human is, is needed. And we have to come with, up with a solution how we're going to integrate that man uh, in, these, uh, in these systems. Uh, and maybe in the, in the future, if it's legally uh, possible, uh, then uh, we can do it, uh, let the systems handle it from uh, beginning to end. So that's a, bit, a little bit the, the developments that are going on uh, within uh, uh, NATO, naval mine warfare, uh, naval mine countermeasures. Uh, despite uh, what uh, the, the Admiral has said here, yeah, Germany is not really involved in, in these uh, uh, unexploded ordnance uh, clearance uh, within their home waters, but uh, within Europe, uh, as stated by him as well, the navies are mostly in, uh, in the lead, uh, and uh, you see that these uh, systems, newer systems, will be used uh, for that as well. But what we are lacking, and we don't uh, uh, develop ourselves, because we don't need it within the way we operate, is a system to uh, clear these uh, unexploded ordnance in a safe environmental uh, way. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, we will uh, um, adhere to, uh, to the regulations, and if it's uh, needed, then we also uh, will uh, take up uh, the, these kinds of systems uh, um, uh, to use them as well uh, for uh, UXO clearance. Um, but I believe that uh, that has to then be uh, uh, um, paid by uh, some other uh, uh, instance and not uh, uh, only the Ministry of, uh, of Defense, as, uh, uh, yeah, as, uh, as I said, because this, these kinds of systems are not normally needed in our inventory for uh, naval mine countermeasures. So that concludes my, uh, my presentations. Um, here you can see my, uh, my contact details if you have any questions or uh, you want to talk with me. I'm, of course, here, but also... Uh, you can contact me later on as well. Thank you. Thank you, Herman. Yeah. Quite a good insight, I think, in uh, what you're actually doing, and what your department is doing. Also quite a bit of challenge. Uh, there your uh, almost last slide about the need for artificial, uh, artificial intelligence that uh, calls upon science again, <clears throat> I would say, and that is a nice, nice bridge to our next presenter, Mr. Uh, Professor Dr. Jens Greinert. He will um, tell us a bit about the edge of science in detection and classification of buried and non-buried uh, objects. Good morning, everybody. So I changed the title of my talk a little bit to munition mapping in dump site examples from Geomas studies in the Baltic Sea. I mean, we talked the last two days about Kolberger Heide and Lübeck Bay, and I will also introduce it to another site, which is Falzhöft. So, and I think these are areas that at least we from Geomas, from a research center, mapped in the last four years quite intensively and have, I think, quite a good idea about what kind of dump munition is uh, actually lying on the seafloor. And of course, I don't do this by myself. I really have to acknowledge my co-workers, which is Mark Seidel, he's a geophysicist. He uh, implemented magnetic sensors on an AUV. This might not be new to everybody. Um, so we saw already a lot of AUVs shown in graphs, not so much in reality, with magnetic sensors. So these things exist, but we wanted to equip our own um, AUV uh, with magnetic sensors because we use a little bit different type of AUV than these typical torpedo-shaped AUVs, which, unless they have some specific thrusters, hover, cap uh, hover capabilities, they have to go because they need the current to have the fins actually keeping the depth. So we used a little bit different AOEs. So the second co-author, even more important than Mark, is actually Mareike Kampmeier. She's a geologist, and she does all the mapping we do with our hydroacoustic system, so the multi-beam mapping from the ship. And all the maps you see here are not prepared by me. They are all made by Marika. so I really want to highlight this. And the third group actually is the AOV group from Geoma uh, that does all the work, the implementation, and act actually also the deployment of the AOVs. So we've seen this map quite some time, 1.6 million tons, give or take. I personally don't believe it's 1.6 million tons because we don't see so much munition 
on the ground in the Baltic as is supposed from the archives. Uh, uh, so, so there is a little bit of a mit uh, mismatch. We focus on three areas. So Kolberger Heide, you know already, just around Kiel. We have Lübeck Bay with two dump sites, Pelzer Hagen and Hafkrug. And then there is one a little bit more further to the north, which is Pfalzhöft. And in Pfalzhöft, there is a slight possibility that even chemical munition has been dumped. This is one reason why we went there to have a look on the seafloor. So I will show those three areas in detail, so you will see bathymetric maps with munition objects. Some of them have been uh, not just uh, uh, detected, but also identified, and in some cases even classified. So this is just the workhorses that we have, is this little hover capacity uh, AUV, which is a commercial uh, system, reasonably cheap compared to these military uh, AUVs. It's from a, a Spanish company, it's Equa Robotics. They are related to Girona. They have a big robotic team who actually developed these systems. And the reason why we bought those systems is we could buy the system with complete open source. So we have the software for running this beast. This is not so easy possible if you go to a large commercial company who have their intellectual property and they will not give you the code, the source code. We have everything. We can make a lot of mistakes if we interfere with the software, uh, but luckily sooner uh, uh, we learned how to, how to work with these systems. So this allowed us actually to um, implement and, and introduce different sensors as we like them uh, to be implemented. So we have these magnetometers. Um, Katja Mattes showed this already. This is the old uh, configuration. We now have three magnetometers in a kind of diamond shape, uh, which are set up two meters from the AUV. I remember the very first or the kickoff meeting of the BASTA meeting, where people from uh, ThyssenKrupp or, or from, from, from uh, Atlas actually said, this is not so easy to have magnetometers on an AUV. You have to tow it four meters, five meters behind. And we said, ah, we will see. We are optimistic scientists. We will just get it going. So we made some measurements and moved the, the, the magnetometers different distance to all the rotating thrusters and cables and power and what have you that disturbs the magnetic field. Yeah? And we figured out with two meter distance, everything is fine. We have some jitter, but we are talking about few nano Tesla jittering. Yeah, that's all. And then we see the Earth magnetic field. So we, uh, I think we came up with a reasonably good solution. So we implemented uh, the magnetometers. And what we also did not because of finding and uh, identifying Uxu is we developed cameras ourselves. Because we look at the seafloor, we want to see who's living there, what kind of uh, um, sediment is there, or what kind of resources. We're also doing manganese nodules research in the Pacific, so we need simply cameras. So we build our own camera, which are adjusting to light and, and, uh, and, and, and the, the, the darkness or the brightness of the seafloor. So we change the ASA and what have you, the, the, uh, uh, the, the optical parameters of the camera. And we take these, uh, and we take images, and we of course, bring our own light um, where we developed uh, pressure neutral uh, LEDs, for example. So we very much work hydroacoustically, but also optically. And I haven't seen really a lot of optical sensors, really visual optical sensors in this um, mind counter stuff so far. Um, we also do, and this is one of the ideas that has been brought up already, as uh, to use, to have on the spot autonomous recognition of an object. It doesn't need to be just a, a munition object, it can be anything. So this AI-based uh, on-the-fly on the data processing and, and, and analysis is something we also want to do. And we do this for our acoustics and also for the, for the magnetics. And then maybe a little bit off the track, but for munition dump site, also quite important, how to detect munition. You can also do it chemically. Yeah? If you have huge piles of munition and we know they are leaking and you take a measurement, you will you will see that somewhere in the area, don't know, don't know exactly why, you have to sh should go against the current, there should be a munition source. So we can also use chemical sensors. And uh, there has been a presentation, I think, yesterday about the system, which is shown on the bottom left, uh, bot bottom right, that we can do measurements now in 15 minutes seconds. So photogrammatic reconstruction, that's what we are doing. We take photos, and this is from Kolberger Heide, an image that has been shown for quite some time. So we go with the AUV, typically with 30 centimeters per second and one and a half meters over the seafloor. Yeah, typically, these torpedo-shaped AUVs, they tend to stay a little bit further away because they are quicker. Yeah? So we can creep with 10 centimeters per second 
in one meter distance over the seafloor. We can do this with those AUVs. Yeah, and we take a photo, 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 and then a little bit of magic has to happen, yeah, which is the photogrammatic reconstruction. And the problem with the photogrammatic reconstruction is not the reconstruction, but is to get a good image in first place. We are taking images in the water. We have wavelength-specific absorption, we have motion blur because we don't have enough light, we have backscatter, so all these particles in the water really create a problem. And many of you will say, okay, in the North Sea, you will never get a photo from the seafloor. That's true. In the Baltic, we do. And if you're a little bit experienced about oceanography and that you have plankton blooms when there is a lot of sunlight, but if you want to map an area where you're not in the need to map it now, you can map it at a time in the year where the water is clear enough to take photos. And for the human being, a photo that you can stitch together with photo uh, photogrammatic methods is the best way to determine what you have on the seafloor. Yeah, hydroacoustic images is super, SIS is super, but you miss the color a little bit. So what you see on the right-hand side is this uh, photo mosaic, and in reality, it's much bigger. This is the side with these open explosives. These gray chunks are open explosives. And they are not from a low-order detonation. They have been actually placed in this area uh, by the EOD of, of Schleswig-Holstein because they had to get rid of it. I don't know exactly when it happened, but this is what it happened. You see a bunch of other obstacles, you know, these long cylinder-like uh, objects, which are ground mines, you see a remnant of a sea mine, you see some torpedo heads, and you also see somewhere there is an uh, octagon, more or less in the center. And this is this octagon, this is the anchor of the mooring of Eddie Maza, where he placed his muscles in 2017, I think. And you see this anchor is right next to this open TNT. Yeah, so this is why the muscles from this location have higher concentration. This is the location. So you have seen that. Okay, so what we do is, as I said, oh, it's, a, it's a presenting you what we have done. It's Pfalzhöft area north of, so if you go just a little bit north and then towards, towards the west, there is um, Flensburger Förde. So that's an area which is supposed to have munition. Actually, it's target, or it's not officially declared as a munition dump site so far. I think it's a munition suspected area. So we prove there is munition, so it has to be relabeled by now. Huh? You see a uh, quite flat seafloor. You see some noisy uh, patterns in the, in the bathymetry. These are sediment ripples, so this is not bad data. Uh, maybe one little bit sidetrack. I'm a typically coming from deep sea mapping. Yeah? We don't care about RTK GPS or these kind of things. Our footprint in five kilometers water depth is 50 meters, five zero. And we have super high resolution, low frequency multi-beam systems. Yeah? So we don't care about two meter off in our GPS. You have to care here. You need super duper accurate um, navigation to come to, uh, to create images uh, like this. Nevertheless, it always can be made better, so we still have sometimes problems with some Z offsets in our RTK. However, you see some funny lines with one spot after the other. And these are uh, easier, e uh, easier to detect if you just calculate some derivatives. So that's basic uh, terrain processing that you derive different kinds of derivatives from your bathymetry. Slope is the first derivative. Just And all of a sudden, these little bumps show up much, uh, much clearer. You can also do the surface area, a different type of derivative, uh, color-coded, so that it's typically it's purple now, these, these lines. You see some of them are more roundish, some others are more elongated. You can do this. You have the bathymetry, you have your potential targets, yeah? And uh, what we do then is also to try to see, this is an on-route dumping of munition objects. Yeah? But this on-route dumping goes into a rocky area. And as soon as you're in a rocky area, you have, a, you have an issue. Yeah? Because there are objects which are overgrown, particularly when you're very old munition. Yeah? A rock, an overgrown rock of one meter diameter looks quite similar, at least with hydroacoustics, also with optics, as a sea mine. Yeah. So there it becomes more difficult, and what we do then is we use magnetics. Yeah? And here you see a little bit of a problem, or I can explain you the problem. We have two different layers that we tried to merge from two different systems. One was uh, recorded with a, with, a, with, a, with a ship, and then you send your AOV down. So, and even if the AOV accuracy is quite good, getting it down to centimeter or decimeter accuracy, the navigation, that's not so easy. I think 
it's not solved. So typically we have two different data layers. You can also have your side scan with a, with a different system. So the, the, the uh, recognition of different data layers that they really fit, that's an that's a issue. Yeah? So we sometimes simply move our grids, our magnetic grids, to the areas uh, where we think they have to belong to. We are working on this super high resolution um, navigation underwater. You could put up USB-L systems or what like you. Uh, I think for Navy warfare, putting out a uh, uh, LBL system takes way too much time. So there are ways now that different AUVs, for example, stabilize their navigation when they talk to each other. The other. Uh, so this is something uh, we are also looking into. So this was Falzhöft. This is Kolberger Heide. Here, this green bunch of dots at the very bottom with this crater. This is where the uh, photo mosaic is from. Uh, as I said, very close to Kiel. A lot of objects. I think Marek maybe can correct me. 1,300 large objects. Kolberger Heide is the area with the big boys, with the bombs, with the ground mines, with the sea mines, yeah, and uh, torpedo heads. Yeah, the other area, uh, uh, Lübeck Bay, looks a little bit different. So we do this. What we then try to do also to train our artificial intelligence. No artificial uh, uh, intelligence without training data. So you first have to generate training data for the system you're using. So that's what we do. We do this uh, with experts, me, Jan, Mareike, others, yeah, uh, who simply annotate visually what they see. And we use, as I said, the slope again. Here, that's the area. You see these elongated objects, some ground mines. We have our... Um, uh, our, our bathymetry again. This is just the hill shade relief of the bathymetry. Looks like a black and white image. Uh, all this ripple stuff that you see are, are algae in the area, which uh, sometimes also cause problems. There are rocks around. And this is the area with the photo mosaic, and that's, that's what we get. So if you stitch this together, I think you have a quite good way of uh, detection and ide uh, identification and, and, and classification as well. Good. The third area, Lübeck Bay, two munition dump sites, Falzhöft, uh, Hafkrug and, and Pelzerhagen. This is one of the, uh, the sites. You see also a lot of little dots on the top right, uh, but they're somewhere from this area, so all the coordinates are taken out. Uh, but you also see some more clustery areas with some rough terrain. And this is actually uh, how it looks like when you do, uh, again, these different derivatives. Uh, there is also here, it's a little bit more advanced. Uh, we have the bathymetry top left, and then we have slope, and then we have TRI and uh, surface area, I think. And then you can also start with a little bit of, I call it always GIS magic. You can, for example, um, calculate uh, principal component analysis and then show one of the components. And to the bottom, the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the two right images are one of the components from the principal component analysis and the other one is another one. And we use this to support the expert to, 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 to uh, focus on certain areas where there might be some morphological expression that could be uh, munition. So as you heard, we are focusing on the morphological expression, everything that's on the seafloor, not so much in the seafloor. Uh, we are also doing this, but I will not talk about it. So this is then how it looks like. And the area, you have the scale, so it's 400 meters, so it's a reasonably large area. I don't, didn't make the count here how many single objects are there and how many piles of uh, munition are there. Uh, but, for example, this is, again, an image from one of the munition piles. This is now Hafkrug. Left is the bathymetry. That's only 50 centimeter grid, so I think we could do a little bit better, uh, 25. Uh, but then you see the image next to it. 2,300 images, and you see each box, and you can zoom in and zoom in. And the nice thing, what you have is, you get actually, from the photogrammetry, you get also the, the point cloud, you get a 3D, you get a DTM. Yeah? So you get the topography. And the resolution of this topography here is 5 millimeters. So that's quite high resolution stuff, I think. Yeah? You would see whether a fuse hole is filled or not. Yeah, this is just from taking the images. You can also do this hydroacoustically, but you can also do it with, with uh, optics. Yeah? And I think this is actually quite nice. What I did here, it's a little bit uh, cheating. So I underlay the bathymetry with a hill shade and then put the photo mosaic on top. That's why this bomb is orange. It's actually not really orange, because that's just the, uh, the orange from the, from the topography I, I, I put underneath. Yeah? But this is, for us, very important to determine how much munition is there? How many boxes? What type of boxes? How big are the boxes? Uh, and uh, this is, I'm very happy that I talked to our uh, Navy 
the last two days, because we don't know what's in these boxes. And even Uwe Wiechert, an expert in this munition stuff, he sometimes says, Jens, I have no clue what's in there. Somebody has to look. So and I hope that sooner, maybe not this year, but latest next year, the German Navy is going there, because that's their territory in Lübeck Bay, to say, OK, what is in these boxes? So I'm really much looking forward to next year and this cooperation between science and, and military. OK. So this is my last slide. So we, of course, we also take towed video cameras um, to give us an impression of what's down on the seafloor. You see the two images. And on the right-hand side, there's another, there's another pile of these boxes, uh, again, from Hafkrug. And a geologist immediately starts thinking about, oh my god, what's going on there? You see these nice ripples. You can measure current, uh, current directions and what have you. And also, one thing is these bright white spots. These are bacteria. This is Begiatoa. Begiatoa is a hydrogen sulfide oxidizing bacteria. And funnily enough, this always occurs around these munition dump sites because the munition in the time it's lying there for the last 70 years created, changed the geochemical environments in the sediment and created this slightly reducing uh, ecosystems. Yeah? But Begiatoa is nothing we have to worry about. It occurs more often in the Baltic Sea, so we can we can take it away, the Bechia tour, not so important. OK, I think that's, that's all. Ah, no, that's not all. This is all. Because we made an inventory uh, from uh, at least uh, Pelzerhagen, one of the areas, and this is how the distribution of munition looks like. That's what we saw on the surface. And you can see where is the number, so the total area, the box. 127 of these box piles I showed you. We measured 127, 1,690 single objects. I think the German Navy has some training exercises to do to s figure out. This is just one area. Yeah, there's Hafkrug. Yeah, uh, but what is I think interesting to see is that the total area that is covered with munition is roughly five football fields. Yeah, and the entire area is 10 square kilometers. So in, uh, if you calculate the percentage, 0.34% is covered in these munition dump sites. Yeah? So this is when people, when you talk, there's a munition dump site, they think, oh my god, the next 10 kilometers full of munition. No, it's here, it's here, it's here. And if you would walk over this area, you would see one munition here, and then you really have to walk quite some distance to find the next, uh, the next object. Yeah? Just to give you an impression. Uh, I'm almost done. Uh, I made a very back on the envelope, certainly wrong calculation of what the weight of munition is that is dumped in this area. I said, OK, we have box piles. I say, on average, 500 boxes, each box 100 kilogram, because those munition boxes, they have to be carried by man. You typically, don't make them heavier than 100 kilos, because they need at least two people. Yeah? Typically, they are even lighter. So that's why I said, one box, 100 kilogram, 500 boxes per pile, 6.35 tons. And then objects, the, what was it, uh, 1,690 objects with 200 kilograms, 338 uh, uh, tons. So in total, 6,788 uh, 6, tons. The archive amount is much higher. It's roughly eight times as much. And I wonder myself, where is this stuff? Yeah? We have magnetic data from these munition piles where we see that no magnetic uh, indication exists outside the, uh, the, the hydroacoustic and optical visual uh, de uh, detectable area. There's nothing left and right. There could be something underneath, that's true, yeah, uh, but nothing left and right. So I think these numbers need to be, please take it not for granted that there's 1.6 billion tons in German waters. Could be less. So thank you very much. Thank you, Jens. Six thousand. What was it, Jens? Six thousand four hundred tons. Six thousand eight hundred tons. I remember a project a number of years ago. It took us one and a half year to clear a dump site, and then we took like three thousand tons out. So that was under very difficult circumstances. But just to give it a bit of magnitude, it would take even years to just clear this small one. Right? It's one of the smallest. What I take away from this, Jens, I think it was a nice sentence. There's no artificial intelligence without training data. And that's uh, 
where we tie into uh, Jan Wendt's uh, presentation, and it's going to tell us all about the use of data uh, for, amongst others, artificial intelligence. Jan. Perfect. Thank you very much, Frank. Yeah, good morning also um, from my side. Um, we heard already a lot today about the different variability of sensors, the amount of data. I mean, when you're processing or creating data with a five meter resolution, that's a, just a crazy amount of data if you want to get this for the entire North or entire Baltic Sea and get an understanding of the, of the actual issue. So some new ideas maybe have to be uh, taken into account to deal with this amount. Um, just a few uh, words about us, North IO, a former EGOS, we heard this already, we are 25 people here in Kiel um, dealing with web-based software development, geoinformatics, AI and big data, and yeah, we are also developing the ammunition cataster C. So what's the idea of the ammunition cataster C? Um, you heard today that there is, or over the last days, that there's a huge amount of information actually available from different kinds of sources, being it historic, being it today's data. And yeah, our idea is to bring this into one centralized uh, data hub. So being the data exchange platform for research, uh, for industry, um, also maybe um, together with military to get an understanding um, of the different kinds of information that are accessible. So worldwide, there's a huge amount of data. Um, we would like to make the workflows which are existing with this kind of data, with this information, um, faster, more efficient, um, especially for detection when we go into some kind of industrial offshore environment topic. And we also want to be, and we are almost the hub of scientific data and research projects. Regarding this stuff, the idea came up in the year 2010 when there were discussions with Klaus Pertier about how to get forward with this kind of historic documents in the beginning. And there was a big learning curve. So bringing this kind of different data sets uh, together in one system is extremely, extremely complex. So um, what's also important, um, and we were also asked, why do you do this? Um, we are independent from states, authorities, and administration. We don't have to stop at some kind of uh, border, at some kind of legal administrative um, and borders. And that's what's a big advantage. The AMOCAD system consists um, of different kinds of uh, databases, um, like uh, historical documents, I will come to this point later, um, historical maps, um, munition, but also um, we are involved in many, many research projects. Um, the Damon research projects, where we'll hear about, um, about the risk assessment, AI-based, the Norsirex project, where we also have quite some members here, the Buster project, Jens already showed some results of this. I will also go a bit more into detail about this one. Airpad comes also, um, Conmar is upcoming, and the uh, Mary space, which we will also present later. So let's go to the historic um, data side. So historic data, may it be not 100% correct, um, but uh, it's a very important key for the understanding of the problem of munition contaminants but it is an extremely challenging um, data set. So the information is really scattered over the whole world. We have, for example, um, to cite Uwe here, with this military archive in Freiburg, we're talking about 50 kilometers of documents. So it's just an uh, enormous amount of, of information, which is almost in the most cases not even digitally available, so dot scanned. It's extremely complex, it's heterogeneous, and it greatly varies in quality. So if you see the scans that uh, the team who goes to Freiburg brings, actually you see really everything. Um, very good quality, extremely bad quality in, in terms um, of handwritten documents, um, sometimes only um, yeah, non really well described positioning in these documents, so it's a really challenge. What I just said, the total figure of the documents is, is enormous, and actually we have no idea how much documents actually exist for this topic. But it's a very, very valid information uh, source. So um, just to show you here one visualization of historic information. Um, maybe many of you have heard about the term gardenings, so mine dropping actions actually by the Allied, by airplanes. And um, we found here two documents, actually around just 140 pages, so a smaller data set. Um, 
the circles that you see here, these are the allied gardening operations. The size of the circles shows actually the uh, uncertainty in the spatial positioning um, of the mines. The other data set which you see there, these lines, this is actually the so-called German Zwangswege, and we translate it into something like constrained routes, so routes that have to, be, have to be kept free from munition during the Second World War to have ship traffic possible. So, and what you directly see here, this one document uh, we found in um, Baden-Württemberg, um, this other document was really from the um, UK, complete uh, different data sets. Actually, they have more or less nothing to do with each other, but when you actually plot them onto the map, um, you see this 100%, almost 100%, but very, very good correlation between these two data sets. So if I would go and look for munition, for mines in this context, I would maybe first go actually in, in these areas and go there and map them in very high resolution. Um, we try to move this approach forward. So um, we applied for a funding for an AI-based document processing project, so-called AirPad, so extracting in a semi-automated, maybe automated way at some point, um, information from the historical documents. So it's not like we will replace now all the historians with AI, um, but we will support this process and we will help them to um, be just more efficient with the interpretation. So what's the first step? Um, the first step is actually the document pre-processing. So here on the left side, uh, you can see a document, how it looks when it's scanned. So it has problems. It's really not so easy to recognize later for the next steps. So um, we had quite some students creating training data. So Jens, what you said, we need training data. We need good training data, actually, to, to have some valid output also in, in AI projects. And on the right-hand side, um, there you can see the uh, actual document, how it looks after it went through these uh, AI algorithms. Then the text recognition comes, and due to this pre-processing, we were able to enlarge or um, make the um, text recognition better about 25%, so a really significant amount. After the text recognition, a keyword extraction is happening. So we are feeding this system constantly with new keywords, with new terms, um, specific um, information about locations. We put historic locations in because they are partly even not valid anymore. Um, we have actions, we have um, dates, and we all put this uh, stuff into the system. And out of this, again, we create events to bring them to the map and actually uh, to use some kind of newer technologies like graph databases, what you see here, to connect this kind of information. Because um, it's important to have a document um, or an event seen from different perspectives if you have this kind of information. Not just one German document who states, okay, it was like this, but maybe there is another uh, document that actually refers to this information or there's an allied information. So to get something like a whole, whole picture. So we're planning to have this one, um, let's say it, um, beta ready until the end of, of the year, but it looks quite, quite good already, um, what we can do with this kind of technologies. Yeah, we came to the topic already, big data and data quality, and um, we have to develop new methods in the big data field to deal with this large amount that is actually approaching. So um, what we heard already, the most often used systems, I think there are way more, but um, for offshore munition detection, they are side-scan sonar, they are multi-beam magnetics. And already they are creating large uh, data sets, and most of the time they are uh, analyzed in a manual way. So why are big data technologies necessary? Um, we need a reasonable turnaround time. We have to be faster, simple, and uh, especially when the amounts are growing, no one will be able to do this via hand. So, and we need uh, smart data management and the sharing of large data sets. And we're now going into the field of data quality factors, why they are necessary. So um, we need some kind of a standards, uh, I think that's a big um, topic in this field, standards um, for the estimation of data quality in the beginning, before the survey, so that we can do some um, correct survey planning, um, but also an objective quality check of the measured data for the client and the contractor so that there we have some kind of objective uh, interpretation of the data quality. And this is also part, Jens showed already some of the results of the BASTA project, but this is also part of the BASTA um, project to um, enhance this approach. So um, we are working there intensively um, with Thorsten Frey from the GEOMA and the former project um, of Vali um, to come from a qualitative approach into some kind of a quantitative and more objective approach. 
So um, quality factors, they are stakeholder based. So um, in the Buster project, I think quite some of you are even involved in the um, workshops carried out by Thorsten and by, by Daniel. Um, so um, we try to define based on literature research, based on questionnaires, and based on workshops, um, quality factors and discuss them intensively um, with the industry and with the stakeholders involved. And then implementation to the data processing workflow. So and then we had already the AUV-based detection and identification workflows. So um, the later step, we have to integrate the magnetic sensors for pinpointing and the visual reconstruction wins, which Jens actually showed already. Yeah, the quality metrics, how does this idea work? It's a stakeholder-driven process, so it doesn't bring anything when we, from a just pure technic perspective, tell you, okay, this is the quality and it doesn't work. Um, we need uh, the industry involved, we need the people who are outside uh, involved in this process. So um, there were four reference uh, objects were set, so 150 millimeter shell, GB250, 500, and um, a bottom mine. And um, based on this, based on liter literature research, um, based on workshops and questionnaires, we <coughs> identified 41 um, parameters that are relevant for estimation of data quality. So um, the questionnaire was conducted, and um, based on the questionnaire, it really shows that it is definitely a common understanding between the participants about this data quality and parameters, but there are also deviations in the different kinds of opinions. But the common understanding is there. We have now some examples uh, how this data quality factors uh, can look like. So we have here um, a multi-beam um, data set. And on the right side, you can see the two reference objects. Um, so we actually checked here on the left uppermost side um, about the data point spacing. Is the data point spacing in a way that we can actually detect the object? Um, for a GP500, the data set is almost everywhere green, so it looks quite good. Um, but if we want to detect the 150 millimeter shell, you can see that actually in the south, it's possible to detect it, but the north, the data set quality, is not good enough to detect such kind of an object. The same we have there with the beam footprint um, areas. And this is a quite objective, actually, uh, approach to tell um, the contractor and also the um, client, OK, here we are matching. Here we can fulfill the criteria to detect this kind of um, objects and to bring some kind of objective idea in. And then we're coming to the idea of the data processing, the big data processing, because this is not something anymore that you can do on, or run um, on some kind of desktop computers. So together with the TrueOcean uh, company, we are developing um, a really a big data processing pipeline, a scalable pipeline that we can put into cloud-based um, structures for calculation. So the idea is to really make it scalable, to process large amounts, so we are talking about really terabytes um, where we are heading to, especially when you have autonomous underwater vehicles. Um, the idea is to really make this cloud-based, so to have some really native optimized um, performance. Flexible architecture behind this, so we have to insert more or less every um, calculation formula that we want to calculate based on point clouds or based on grids, different kinds of derivatives. Um, we are at the moment transforming this into um, a stable version. Um, at the moment, we are processing something like, uh, I think, 200 um, gigabyte data sets, and this can be processed in hours. And the more computing power you put in, the faster in the end the whole idea works. Um, and we test this on local and remote cloud systems. Also there, we're looking for more test cooperations. So when you have data, you want to see how this cloud-based scaling of this kind of um, big data processing works, feel free to, to contact us. And we had already the usage of artificial intelligence. Commander Lammers um, said this, uh, Jens said this also, that is a very important um, point in supporting us. It won't take every decision away from us, and this is also not what it's supposed to be, but supports us. So um, we need for the analysis of really large-scale data sets um, new AI-based um, approaches. So the most important thing is we need training data. So we need a sufficient training data set, and this is the most um, work-intensive part. Um, we were discussing, I think, uh, really intensively about the training data for Buster, how to actually acquire it in the best way. So the quality of the training data was a discussion, quite intense. Um, we need also really high-resolution data sets if we would like to have some usable um, output. 
we need extremely good positioning um, if we want to dive deeper in also in the um, topic of sensor fusion approaches. Jens said this already. If we have two different kinds of platforms that carry sensors, we all the time have immediately problems. Um, and also what we are also now focusing on is not to do the object detection on raster images anymore because raster is actually derived from the original point cloud, but to go one step deeper and to work on the point cloud because there's just more information in this data set available. Yeah, that was my presentation. Thank you very much. Thanks, John. Klaus, are there any questions from, let's say, the online audience? Yes, uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I think now we have, yeah, it's working. Um, yes, we have a little bit of activities out there. And uh, the first question is, is Michael still available for us? Mike, are you still with us or have you fallen asleep? Uh, I'm still here. Ah, wonderful. Uh, okay. So I need we to start with a personal remark. Best regards to Michael. Uh, thank you for interrupting your night sleep for us. And most important, is your family safe and your home undamaged from Hurricane Ida? Well, thank you very much for asking. Uh, we were very lucky. Uh, I work actually for a company named Ida, but that's all right. Uh, <laughs> we're on the we're on the um, east side, so uh, we had limbs down and damage, but. Uh, it was nothing like Katrina, which uh, totally devastated us, uh, which uh, a while ago, but we were fine. Okay, that's good to hear. <laughs> I, I have uh, some friends in Laf Lafayette, and they have had uh, serious floods. Oh, yeah. Um, I guess so. So now the, the question to you. Uh, yesterday, we have heard a lot about biological effects and so on. And the question is, to what extent biological effects of underwater munitions are subject of research with CERDAP ESTCP? Um, I, I think we have a s slightly different emphasis in uh, our programs. Uh, we, in, within the munitions response program, um, do not have a component for um, energetic compounds and their effect on the environment. That's in environmental restoration. Now, I did go back and look to see what they were doing, and um, I think they have uh, slightly less uh, worries in terms of um, the contamination due to energetics, uh, either corroding from or broken, uh, or, or from broken uh, UXO than your problems are. But then again, your problems are more related to dumping sites where our, si our problems are more related to um, areas of testing and training for um, uh, the uh, artillery and other kinds of things like that and transferring the uh, DOD property back to the public. So uh, maybe our areas are more open and solution is the dilution to pollution. But um, I really think that uh, those people that are really interested in it from the European side, uh, it's best to get their own uh, view mm -hmm. from the workshop that I mentioned. <laughs> um, I mean, I can tell you what, uh, what I read from it, but uh, I haven't fully digested the 150 page workshop report yet. So, uh, I think that your problems are, are very real and very important, and they're uh, essentially regulatory uh, drivers uh, for a lot of work that you're going to do, where ours are probably less so in terms of uh, the munition contamination. Okay. I don't know if that, that doesn't really that doesn't really answer your question, but <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm looking very much forward to continue cooperation across the Atlantic Ocean in this field. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions, uh, Klaus? Yeah, actually, there is one other question that refers to our first keynote this morning and uh, the contribution of Mr. Lamas. Uh, we have learned about a close connection of exchange data within military and civilian authorities in the Baltic Sea. I might have missed it, but is there a comparable network of munition, uh, mine warfare data centers around the North Sea states? 
There is a network of uh, mine warfare data centers around the North Sea, um, and they do exchange uh, data, but not uh, in the extent uh, like it's done in, in the Baltic. So uh, basically, each nation knows where uh, the munition dimp areas are uh, and where munition can be found. Uh, but there's no, like it is in the Baltic, a Baltic almanac which uh, contains uh, all the information. But if you uh, want to get uh, that information, you can easily get it from the respective uh, mine warfare data center. And indeed, we are looking into uh, connecting uh, them all together. Uh, as I said, with the, with the upcoming of these new systems and the huge amount of data that we are collecting, it would be nice to share that as well. And that is also uh, a, a task of those mine warfare data centers. To continue a bit on that, uh, Herman, uh, we heard uh, Vice Admiral uh, Schönbach offer his services this morning to the general public. Um, out of your experience, what what could those services be? Uh, obviously, for clearing uh, discussion at the moment, uh, we don't need all the uh, let's say the the tools to just uh, perform on the was the blasts. But what kind of you know uh, sensors or equipment or personnel could be made available to the public or to, let's say, the civil world to start helping clearing those dump sites? Well, if I see uh, the, the, the techniques uh, that are being used here in the, in the scientific uh, part, for instance, uh, I'm really impressed and I don't think that uh, our equipment could really uh, uh, add something to, to that. Uh, if you have a good oversight of the uh, ammunition uh, dump site, uh, then, then we are uh, able to uh, assist with uh, with uh, EOD experts, uh, basically, and that mostly are, uh, are divers, uh, but also uh, uh, other experts, uh, and, and uh, assist in, uh, in uh, identifying exactly uh, what it is and, and uh, e uh, eventually uh, removing uh, the, uh, the explosives uh, from, from that side. Uh, in some nations, uh, it is uh, only the Navy that is allowed to deal with explosives at sea, for instance. So, uh, Correct. In some states it is. And Germany is different, as we yep. learned this morning, uh, but in some states it is. Uh, another question, uh, we saw amazing pictures, uh, Jens, uh, from, of your research. Uh, it looks like looking at a photo, actually. It's beautiful. We see a lot of boxes. We don't know what's inside. Uh, so is there any way you feel in, let's say, prioritizing the clearance of the stuff we find so far? You know, are they all equally dangerous? Are they all equally pressing in time and waiting to be cleared? Or is there sort of a hierarchy we can allow ourselves in saying, okay, we'll clear this first and the rest has to wait. We certainly have to do this. I mean, we can't clear everything in one day, so <laughs> we, have to, we have to have a kind of priority list. And I would go, I would come from the chemical side. I would see, okay, where is the strongest chemical contamination? And at the moment, it seems to be in Lübeck Bay. I'm not sure whether we should start in Lübeck Bay because it's, from the environmental point of view, a little bit more difficult than other areas. I think I would go to Falzhöft. Uh, but what we, for, uh, coming back to the question before, what the military or what the Navy could help us is to figure out what's in these boxes, because we don't know this. Okay. And I think this is in their territory. They are just three nautical miles on the shore. That's where they are sitting. Correct. So they could yeah. do this. And I, as I said, I hope that uh, they will do this then uh, next year already or start with it. And this will be very important information to figure out where to start first. Correct. Yeah. yeah because you also have to know, okay, in what kind of condition is the munition? Where is where is the easy prey? I would start with the easy prey. Low not, with the, not with the yeah. difficult thing. No, yeah. of course. Yeah. And then ramp up to the more difficult parts uh, yeah. later Le on. Learn by doing it. Yeah. And, okay. Uh, Sven, you would have a question. Yes, thank you. <coughs> this morning I'm speaking on behalf of NABU. Um, I have two questions, one to Jens and one to um, Commander Lamas. Um, Jens, you just said that you would prefer false hift uh, for a pilot uh, rather than hide cart, for example. Can you uh, please uh, give some arguments for that? And you mentioned that uh, there is a mismatch uh, in what you found and uh, what historical documents say. And uh, just a remark, uh, NABU is going to have a side event on the historic side of Heidkarte uh, tomorrow for those who speak German. That's going to be um, at five o'clock in the afternoon uh, in a different venue. So if you're interested in that, please contact me. Uh, there's a website where you can register for that. Um, but that. That's the first question, why Falzhoft and not Heidkarte? And uh, to Commander Lammers, um, 
in the past two weeks there have been um, strandings of about 150 harbor porpoises on the Dutch Wadden Sea Islands um, at, a sim uh, at a similar decomposition state, so they are most likely from the same place. Sven, so I'm sorry to cut you off, but we are running out of time. On oh, sorry, I, so I, I would make it quick. Ask you a very, very quick answer, Jens. Uh, on 10.30, I'm sure Terry's going to kick us off the stage for the uh, next uh, presentation. The yeah. reason for Falsift, it, it was an idea that I had last week, so it's not really deeply thought through. But uh, Kolberger Heide is full of munition, and if something goes wrong there, you have a big issue. In Falsif, the munition is further distributed from each other, so it's not as dangerous. Uh, it's uh, similar depth, very sandy, good for, for, for putting a platform down. So from the technical side of view, I think that's a better one. Okay. It's uh, not uh, the one for environmental impact. Okay. Yes, yeah, so we'll leave it to it. I would like to thank you all for participating, especially Mike. Mike, you can return to bed now, if you can still sleep, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for your contribution. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, audience online and here present for your uh, attention and uh, wishing you uh, a very nice day. Thank you.